Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful place. And thank you all for coming. So I understand it's not that easy to escape. Uh, so th there is no much choice. <coughs> so this, in this talk, I will review our more or less four years activity on developing uh, the framework and the physical understanding of spin and charge <coughs> dynamics and coupling between spin and charge degrees of freedom in superconductors. And the main point I want to make in this talk is the connection uh, between what one would call the <coughs> classical spintronic or spin arbitronics in the normal system uh, with phenomena like spin hole effect uh, or spin galvanic effects uh, to the similar phenomena in superconductors. It turns out that there is the practically direct correspondence between spin hole effect and spin galvanic effects in the normal system and the effects like uh, formation of phi knot junction uh, in the superconductor. So that, that's essentially, from the physical point of view, this is the same thing. And the, I will convince you, I hope I will convince you that that's indeed the case. So I start from reviewing the description of spin and charge coupling in normal conductors. Then I will discuss a little bit uh, the standard description of proximity effect in diffusive superconducting structure and then consider uh, how the intrinsic spin orbit coupling enters into the theory of the superconducting proximity effect. And if I have time, I will also discuss a little bit the extrinsic spin orbit coupling due to in superconducting structure, the spin orbit coupling at random uh, impurity potentials. In the normal conductance, the most known effect coming from uh, coupling between charge and spin degrees of freedom due to spin orbit coupling is a spin hole effect. The spin hole effect is a connection between the charge and spin currents. The direct effect is say we generate somehow the primary charge current and this primary charge current generates a transfer spin current in the direction perpendicular to, to the charge one. And other way around, if it generates somehow the spin current, it will produce a charge current in the perpendicular direction. Formally, there is a linear connection between the spin current and the charge current, and the coefficient is a spin hole angle. Generically, the third rank tensor. In the cubic material, the third rank tensor is simply proportional to the antisymmetric tensor. Qualitatively, one may think that in the material there is something which deflects the uh, trajectories of spin up and spin down uh, charge carriers in the opposite direction, so that if we generate the charge current, it will produce a spin current and eventually the spin accumulation at the edges of the sample. Or if there is a spin current flowing, then there will be charge separation and the voltage across the sample. That is essentially how one measures the spin hole effect because the spin current by itself is not experimentally observable. Another class of phenomena that the spin galvanic effect or the Edelstein effect, that's the coupling between the bulk spin polarization and the electric current. The spin hole effect I discussed a minute ago is an absolutely universal phenomenon. Practically in every material which has a sizable spin orbit coupling, uh, we can observe the spin hole effect. The <coughs> spin galvanic effect requires more on the symmetry. There must be the inversion symmetry <coughs> broken or even more. The system must be gyrotropic. It's a little bit more than just a plain uh, inversion symmetry uh, breaking. In this case, we may connect the spin, which is an <coughs> axial vector, to the current or to the electric field, which is a polar vector. The gyroptropy is required as it allows the existence of a pseudotensor, which may connect the axial and the polar vectors. If the charge current is generated by the electric field, then in the presence of the gyrotropic symmetry, 
this generates a spin polarization and the coefficient between the electric field and the spin polarization one sometimes call it Edelstein conductivity. There is an important and non-trivial relation between the direct and inverse spin galvanic effect. As the electric field is a time derivative of a vector potential, we may relate the Edelstein conductivity to the spin current Kuba correlator. And since in the normal conductors there must be no reaction on a constant vector potential, the gauge invariance requires that the <coughs> uh, correlator between spin and current vanishes at zero frequency. If for some reason the Edelstein conductivity is constant, this means that the spin charge correlator vanishes linearly with, with the frequency, which means that the inverse Edelstein effect or the direct spin galvanic effect is related not to the applying the field which drives the spin, which is a Zeeman field, but to the time derivative of it. So if the direct effect means that applying the electric field will generate a spin polarization, the inverse effect is the generation of a current by the rate of generation of spin. And that's very important and that's a conceptual difference from the superconductors, which we will see in a moment. Now, how we describe all these effects Theoretically, I will consider the case of intrinsic band structure generated spin orbit coupling, <laughs> which physically means that at the microscopic level, there is the internal Zeeman field, momentum dependent Zeeman field. The spins of moving electrons, because it depends on momentum, the spin of moving electrons <laughs> processes in some effective internal, <coughs> uh, I I internal Zeeman field. And since spins of moving electrons preserve, uh, precess, it is not conserved, which means that in the effective diffusion equation for the macroscopic spin density, there will be a torque, which reflects non-conservation of the spin in the presence of spin orbit coupling. The structure of this torque can be revealed by the, something like a gradient expansion. It must depend on the observables we have in the system, which is a spin and charge density. There is a term which is plainly proportional to the spin, and this term corresponds to the spin relaxation tensor. As <coughs> spin processes only on the moving electrons, these three terms in the gradient expansion, the plane proportion, proportional to the spin, proportional to the gradient of the spin density and gradient of the charge density, they reflect different types of motion. The spin relaxation comes from the random motion of the carriers. It moves, it scatters, moves within another momentum, which means processes about different uh, angle, and this repeats, and this randomizes the motion of spin, and this leads to the spin relaxation. That's a so-called diaconov pirel mechanism for the spin relaxation. The term proportion to the <coughs> gradients comes from the average motion of, of the carriers. If the spin distribution is not uniform, then the spins in average diffuse, they move, and they process in the average field. And this is described by this tensor, which we may call the spin precession tensor. And finally, because in a system we may have a spin hole effect, then the non-uniformity of the charge distribution also causes the motion of spin, and since spins move, they precess, and this produces an additional torque. And this one may call the spin hole torque. The important point that this coefficient couples the spin and the charge degrees of freedom. So there is a non-uniformity of spin, or of the charge density, and this produces a torque in the spin diffusion equation. Let's look more closely <coughs> on the spin diffusion equation in the case of a stationary spin distribution. This is that <coughs> spin diffusion equation if, the sp if everything is stationary, the time derivative is zero. There is this coefficient which couples the spin and charge degrees of freedom, and from the reciprocity, it is clear that there should be a similar term in the charge diffusion equation. In the presence of spin orbit coupling, specifically in the presence of a system with gyrotropic symmetry, such a coefficient which couples a spin and charge <coughs> degrees of freedom, it is a pseudo tensor, it couples 
polar and axial tensor produces the spin charge coupling. And now the motion of spins and the charge charges at the average level. The diffusion is not independent. This coefficient describing the spin charge coupling in particular leads to the spin galvanic or to the Edelstein effect, which one can very easily see from that equation. Assume that we produce the constant gradient of the charge density, which generates a constant charge current. All gradients here vanish. The gradient spin, spins of ze uh, are zero. And then this term generates a torque, <coughs> the spin-hole torque. And the spin-hole torque is balanced by the spin relaxation. As a result, we are getting non-trivial spin polarization proportional to the spin-hole torque divided by the spin relaxation rate. This coefficient, so this is the spin relaxation and the spin hole torque, or the current induced spin polarization. Uh, <coughs> they, they are responsible for the magnetoelectric effect. The spin precession tensor is also has an important effect on the spin diffusion. In particular, this tensor is responsible for the generation of a spin helix, because this produces the rotation of, of a diffusive spin. If we consider the solution of this spin diffusion equation with given spin at the surface, then this term generates a helicoidal pattern. Anisotropy of the, <coughs> anisotropy of the spin relaxation rate also can generate, a, can generate the helicoidal pattern. So all in all, what we have the presence of the spin precession at the microscopic level, it shows up as a generation of a helicoidal pattern of the spins injected in the, into, the, uh, into the conductor. What we can expect for the superconducting system? First of all, there will be the analog of the Edelstein of a spin, or, or a spin galvanic effect but there is one important difference. In the superconductors, we may have non-zero non spin charge correlator at zero frequency because the vector potential can be <coughs> enters together <coughs> with the gradient of phase. In the superconductor, we have an object, uh, which is a superfluid velocity, which is, which is a gauge invariant combination. And that means that there can be a coefficient linearly connecting current and the vector potential. That's essentially the same argument as for the Meissner effect. So we may have a linear connection between the observable and the vector potential itself, which means that in the superconductors, the existence of a condensate and the phase gradient allows for the existence of a non-zero spin charge correlator. And that means that by creating a supercurrent or by applying a phase gradient, we may polarize our system. So the equilibrium current, non-dissipative current, polarizes the system. Or even more interesting, because of the reciprocity, if we polarize our system, by the Zeeman field, we will produce a current in equilibrium. So essentially that means that in a ferromagnet with a geotropic symmetry, we must observe an anomalous supercurrent flowing in the equilibrium. This in particular leads to the effect which is known as a phi knot effect or phi knot junction, the junction which supports a supercurrent in the absence of the phase gradient, a phase difference. Another thing which we may expect is that the charge spin conversion, which we saw in the normal system, which are governed by this spin charge coupling or spin hole coupling coefficient, should lead to the singlet triplet conversion. So we may expect that there will be the analog of the spin hole effect, which is a production of a charge current out of the spin current or production of <coughs> of a spin current out of the charge current. And also, the spin helix, spin helicoidal pattern generated in normal conductor when we produce a spin somewhere at the boundary of a system, should be translated to the generation of the so-called long-range 
triplet superconductivity, the rotation of initially generated triplet when it diffuses into the system in the presence of spin orbit coupling. <coughs> so now I will consider this in more detail, but first I review the description of uh, superconductors. The main difference with the normal metals is the existence of the pair correlations between the time reversal conjugated states, which translates into the existence of the anomalous Green's function in addition to the usual normal Green's function. So the <coughs> Green's function becomes a matrix of twice larger dimension because there is an anomalous function coupled the time reversal conjugated subspaces, the electron and hole subspaces. And this object is needed to describe the old physics of superconductors. In practice, normally the uh, Fermi wave length is the short, shortest length scale in the system, and in the Green's function, there will be fast oscillations uh, on the scale of the Fermi wave length. It is con uh, <coughs> convenient to single out this normal this, this known oscillating behavior, and the object which remains is a coefficient in front of this fast oscillating exponent, which is called the quasi-classical Green's function. This quasi-classical Green's function depends on the coordinate, on time arguments, and on the direction of the Fermi momentum. So this quasi-classical Green's function describes dynamics of quasi-particles at the Fermi surface. And this is the object <coughs> I will be discussing further. It also has a normal part and the anomalous part, and this is how this normal and anomalous part look for the usual BCS superconductor. For the experts, I will say that from this point, I will be discussing the weak proximity effect. Weak proximity effect means uh, that everything inside the normal metal proximized from a superconductor can be described solely in terms of the anomalous Green's function. The anomalous Green's function in the equilibrium, it depends on the coordinate and on the on the frequency, and I'm assuming the diffusive limit, so which means that it does not depend on momentum. So it's a local measure of the spectral condensate density. The proximity effect is the diffusion of the condensate when it is injected from the superconductor. When we bring together the superconducting and the normal material, I'm ignoring spin orbit coupling for a moment. That's just a reminder how it works. And for the anomalous Green's function, we have a diffusion equation. It's like the usual diffusion equation for the charge or spin density, so there is a diffusive term, but there is a finite penetration depth because the Cooper pairs, when they enter the normal metal, they die. So they decay on the coherence lens. And this reflects the presence of this omega-dependent term in the <coughs> diffusion equation for the condensate function. This is called the Uzadl equation, so the equation for the diffusion of the spectral condensate density. If the condensate is injected by the boundary conditions from the superconducting to the normal metal, then it diffuses and decays on the characteristic <coughs> penetration uh, lapse, uh, lens of penetration depth, which is inversely proportional to the critical temperature. The supercurrent, so the current created by the uh, diffused pairs in the normal metal, is calculated from the structure, which is very similar to the usual quantum mechanical expression for the charge current. So this F function plays the role of the wave function of a, super, uh, 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 of, of a condensate, but it is spectrally resolved. So to calculate the physical current, we compile this current expression and sum up over all the frequencies. If there is only one superconductor and then normal metal, then clearly that the phase which we inject from that side, it preserved and therefore this, this, this current is plainly zero. To get a non-zero current, we must have at least two superconductors on both sides and the phases should be different. Otherwise, this expression is plainly zero. It is non-zero only when the two superconductors have different phases. 
Just yeah, 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 we have a temperature, yeah, okay, that's uh, just, just to, just, Not easy, but just uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree, yeah, I, I, I meant that the, in, in this case, the weak proximity means that we are close to, uh, to TC, yeah, something like that, okay. but generically, yes, of course, that's, uh, that's the sort of Mutsubara frequency, which is simply proportional to TC, that's right, and then, if we have two superconductors with different phases, we have the Josephson supercurrent flowing through the system uh, with the coefficient, which is a critical current here, and this coefficient is uh, proportional to the exponent where this is a distance between the superconducting electrons and the penetration depth. Now we go further and introduce a spin degree of freedom. Uh, generically, the anomalous Grin's function uh, depends on the spin, and we may, may separate uh, the singlet and the three, the three triplet components of the condensate. Pauli principle requires that the uh, wave function of the Cooper pair is antisymmetric, or the anomalous Grin's function is antisymmetric with respect to the uh, uh, arguments. This means that the triplet component must be antisymmetric in, in frequency. So, in the diffusive limit, when all momenta are averaged out, and there is only dependence on the time argument of the Green's wave function, all triplets must be odd in frequency, and therefore it is convenient just to separate it out. Yeah? So, just to introduce this small uh, triplet Green's function, which is already <coughs> even in frequency. If we look on the structure of the triplet and the singlet, this triplet and this singlet uh, spin uh, wave functions, we see that the Zeeman field couples these two components. So the triplet component, which corresponds to the projection of the Cooper pair spin uh, on the direction perpendicular to the, to, the, to the wave function, it couples to the singlet wave function. So, which means that if we have a Zeeman field, then the singlet becomes coupled to a triplet. In particular, this component is coupled to that component. What does it mean for the diffusion of the condensate? Then the Uzadl equation should be written for both singlet and triplet components, and these singlet and triplet components are coupled to each other. So there is a usual diffusive parts for the singlet and triplet condensate, and there is a coupling proportional to the Zeeman field, which couples this component or the component parallel to the so-called parallel. Yeah, that, yeah, I just introduces, uh, introduced those indices in such a way. Yeah, the, I will call it parallel. Parallel to the Zeeman field to the singlet. The important point is that it couples with the phase shift of pi half because the Zeeman field breaks the time reversal symmetry, and this breaking time reversal symmetry makes a complex conjugated equation, uh, uh, equations are not equivalent. That will be a very important point in the future, that the Zeeman field introduces the singlet and triplet coupling, and the phases of the singlet and the induced triplet are shifted by pi half. What is the physical effect of the Zeeman field? The physical effect is essentially killing the proximity effect or weakening the proximity effect because there is here the Zeeman field and effectively if the Zeeman field becomes large, uh, then the penetration depth is determined not by the temperature or by the omega, but by the Zeeman field, by the largest coefficient here. So if we will <coughs> Generate here, if this is the <laughs> S-wave superconductor, and here we inject the singlet Cooper pairs in a ferromagnet, <laughs> then they will penetrate here, the singlet will enter, the Zeeman field will generate a triplet, and they diffuse, coupled to each other, and decay on the length scale, which is inversely proportional to the Zeeman field. And this length is much shorter than the uh, usual penetration depths if the Zeeman field is large enough. In addition, there are oscillations which are uh, 
reminiscent of the full deferral uh, state. Once more, the triplet generated out of the singlet injected into the ferromagnet is shifted with respect to the singlet by pi half. So now we can try to understand how the spin orbit coupling will enter this construction. I remind you the coupled spin charge diffusion equation in normal conductor. So there is a spin relaxation, the spin precession tensor, and the spin charge coupling coefficient. The Cooper prayers are made out of the time reversal conjugated states. And since spin orbit coupling is invariant with respect to the time inversion, that means that spin orbit coupling acts differently uh, uh, in the same way on the electron and, and the whole component of the Bogolubov quasi particle on the Cooper prayer. Which means that we may expect that precisely the same coefficients which are here in a normal state will enter the coupled singlet-triplet diffusion equation for, uh, for the <coughs> singlet and uh, triplet condensate, which means that there will be the usual part, these two terms and this term, and this term, and, the, and this one, so the black terms, which we had in the uh, coupled singlet-triplet <laughs> diffusion equation in the presence of only the Zeeman term, and then in addition, we may expect the appearance First of all, the singlet-triplet coupling with the same coefficient we had here. So the coupling, the gradient coupling between the singlet and triplet condensate. The spin precession term in the diffusion of the triplet condensate and in additional spin relaxation. So that is what is physically expected and that is what turns out to be indeed the case. So what we have is the additional relaxation of the triplet condensate, the spin rotation of the condensate, and these two terms, we know that in the normal system they produce the spin helix, and here it will be rotation of the triplet condensate out of its initial direction when we diffuse into the system. And that means that this, we will produce a new component of the condensate which, which will not decay with the Zeeman field, but will decay with the usual uh, penetration depth in the superconductor. And this is what people call the long-range triplet condensate. So that's essentially the consequence of the spin precession induced by the spin orbit coupling. And finally, we have an addi additional uh, spin charge coupling. And this additional spin charge coupling is time reversal invariant. Zeeman spin charge coupling brings shift by pi half, but this spin charge coupling produces a coupling with the same phase. So which means that in those equations, we get additional complexity, additional complex structure, which may, may produce the, the new phase. And this may produce the anomalous current. So now I will turn to the construction of those equations or the derivation of those equations from the microscopic view for a particular model of spin orbit coupling, which is a generic model, essentially a generic model for uh, geotropic materials. This is the model Hamiltonian or the model of intrinsic spin orbit coupling, which is linear in momentum. Generically, the gyrotropy allows for the existence of the second rank pseudo tensor. So the, the tensor which couples the, uh, the, the uh, pseudo vectors and, and, the, uh, and the polar vectors. And that is precisely what is required to construct the linear in momentum spin orbit coupling. So then I will consider the generic one particle Hamiltonian with a spin orbit coupling which is linear in momentum. And this linear in momentum spin orbit coupling can be written, the, the Hamiltonian with this linear in momentum spin orbit coupling up to a constant can be written in this nice form. So spin orbit coupling essentially enters a, a, as a gauge field. So it shifts the momentum in the kinetic energy. And the Zeeman field, this term, enters a, as a time component of, of an effective gauge field. So it looks like the vector and the scalar potential, but this vector and scalar potential are now matrix-valued. They are 
two by two matrices. So generically, the spin orbit coupling and the Zeeman field enter as a space and time components of an effective SU2 gauge field, built in, external. And then generically, any spin orbit coupling linear in momentum can be described in that way. The example is the famous rashba driscoll house spin orbit coupling. This corresponds to a particular non-zero particular components of this SU2 gauge field. What is important about this form? Yeah, first of all, it's formally just rearrangement, <coughs> but the important that this form suggests that there is an exact symmetry. If we will make the local, with some local parameter, arbitrary local SU2 rotation of the Hamiltonian and simultaneously change the vector potential, do a gauge transformation, the Hamiltonian stays form invariant. And this is the, essentially the gauge symmetry, the form invariance of the Hamiltonian under the gauge transformation. And if so, then we can immediately from here say that spin orbit coupling may enter in physical observables in, 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 the <coughs> in the physical results and in a theory formulated in the proper covariant way, may enter only via covariant combinations. The combinations which transform covariantly under the gauge transformation. What are those combinations? We cannot have just a plain derivative because if we will do SU2 uh, transformation, the, the local gauge transformation, then the plane derivative does not transform covariantly. But there is a combination, the derivative plus the commutator, which transforms covariantly. This is called covariant derivative. So instead of derivatives, in the presence of the linear in momentum spin orbit coupling, we must have covariant derivative. There is no other way because we know that everything must be covariant. So just from the beginning, we may say that our theory should contain derivatives only in that form. The spin orbit coupling by itself also cannot enter. It may enter only in the, in the covariant combinations, which are the field strength tensor. So these A's are coefficients, so like Rajba alpha beta, the, the Rajba driscoll house coefficients, and we know that in the answers, in the physical observables, they must enter via these combinations, via the covariant combinations made out of the spin orbit coupling. The examples are the, the particular, <coughs> particular components of this field strength tensor, uh, the magnetic field, SU2 magnetic field, which will produce the spin-dependent deflection of trajectories. This is what we need for the spin hole effect, for example, uh, or the time space component is the SU2 electric field. We will see uh, for which effects it is important. So now we may say, we, we may go through the mass, but basically from the, uh, this gauge argument, we may say how the Uzadl equation will be modified by spin orbit coupling. First, the most obvious modification is the replacement of the <coughs> Laplacian in the diffusion operator uh, in the spin, uh, in, in, in the condensate diffusion equation, replacement it by the covariant Laplacian. If we will just open the square of this operator, we will see the usual Laplacian, the linear in spin orbit coupling term, and this is nothing but the spin rotation, and the quadratic and the zero gradient in F uh, contribution, which is nothing but the diacon of Pirelli relaxation. So in a sense, from the gauge uh, argument, we can write down immediately the diffusion equation, and out of here, we immediately get the physically expected terms. The torques, contribution to the torques, which is a uh, spin precession term, and the diacon of period spin relaxation. But at that level, we don't have spin charge coupling. At that level, we have only the, <coughs> only the uh, rotation and the relaxation. And apparently, what we may expect is something like generation of, of, the, of the spin helix. Indeed, I will consider here, I, I, I consider just, just a simp simple example. Yeah? So the uh, very simple, uh, like 3D Rajba, isotropic, uh, for the example, isotropic spin orbit coupling, uh, 
and the Zeeman field uh, along Z direction. I have a superconductor and can see that the diffusion into the, into the ferromagnet. What produces the Zeeman field? It generates, at, at the boundary, it generates a triplet along uh, Z direction. And then this triplet diffuses together with a singlet, so we, we inject a uh, singlet, it generates a triplet via the Zeeman field, and then it diffuses and the spin part rotates. Spin part rotates and we see what happens. So if you look on the penetration of the, on the condensate function, this is a singlet condensate, the triplet condensate, the green line, uh, which is parallel to the uh, original Zeeman field, this is what we would have without spin orbit coupling, but then uh, because of this uh, spin helix effect essentially, because of the, uh, of the rotation of the condensate due to the Rajbach coupling, we, uh, uh, Rajbach term, we have this coupling between the two components of the, uh, of the triplet condensate. One is the usual one, which contains the Zeeman field, and then because of this it decays fast. We generate the, the triplet which is, <coughs> which is perpendicular to the Zeeman field, and this decays with the length scale which is determined by the diacon of period relaxation time and the temperature, uh, which, which is larger, which is much larger. So that's a generation of the, uh, uh, of the long, <coughs> long range triplet condensate, which is particularly responsible for the long range uh <coughs> proximity effect. What is important to realize is that this long-range triplet condensate is generated only if the component along the inhomogeneity does not commute with the Zeeman field. So, which means that the part of spin orbit which is coupled to the momentum which is along the inhomogeneity of, of, the, of the singlet, so perpendicular to the junction, roughly speaking, it must not commute with the, uh, with the Zeeman field. And this commutator is nothing but the SU2 electric field. So we can formulate this as follows. That the long-range triplet condensate is generated by the SU2 electric components of the SU2 electric field along the uh, uh, direction of the inhomogeneity. And out of here, we may immediately conclude that, for example, if the spin orbit coupling is related to the, to the Rushby effect at the interface, then there will be no long range proximity effect in these vertical structures because the spin orbit coupling is, is coupled only to the momentum uh, in, in the lateral direction, in this direction. And then there is no SU2 electric field in that direction. Only in the lateral structure, like this, we may expect the long range proximity effect because there is a component of the SU2, there is an inhomogeneity in this direction in between these two uh, superconductors, and then there might be a long-range triplet condensate uh, penetrating in this direction. If you will calculate the Josephson current, the, the critical Josephson current for this structure, for example, we will see <coughs> that it is proportional to the square of this SU2 electric field because we must first from the singlet generate a triplet, long range triplet goes here and then is converted back to the singlet. And this is why we have square here. And it decays on the length scale, which is the usual, <coughs> usual penetration depths in, in the superconductors. So now what about the spin charge coupling? To take into account the spin charge coupling, uh, so essentially we understand that it comes from the spin hole effect. Yeah, it's a, uh, it is a part of a spin hole torque. This is a torque in the, in the spin diffusion <laughs> equation which is related to the motion of spin generated by the charge in homogeneity. Or it is related to the physically <coughs> to, the, to the deflection of the, to the spin hole effect, uh, to the deflection, spin dependent deflection of trajectories. So one must go a little bit further in the, in the quasi-classical expansion to be, to be formal uh, for, for deriving the diffusion equation <coughs> and take into account the Lorentz force. So that is a spin dependent, that's, uh, that's the usual term, that's the momentum and the momentum derivative and that's the anti-symmetric tensor. It's like a, 
V cross P times the P derivative, like the usual Lorentz force and the Boltzmann equation. This is what appears in the uh, equation of motion for the non-averaged yet, yeah, for the, the Eilenberger equation for the condensate, for the anomalous Green's function. So we have to take into account the Lorentz force effect, which leads to the, to the deflection, spin-dependent deflection of trajectories. And already at that level, we see that spin-dependent Lorentz force introduces an additional spin charge coupling. So it introduces this SU2 Lorentz force, spin-dependent deflection of trajectories, which eventually leads to the conversion of the moving charge into the moving spin. And in combination with the spin-orbit coupling leading to the precession of spins, so we first generate the spin-dependent conversion of the moving charge into the, uh, into the moving spin, and then we may rotate this spin by the spin precession caused by spin-orbit coupling, and this all together leads to the <coughs> spin galvanic effects in a normal metal and generation of anomalous current in the superconductors, or at the formal level, generation of an additional, even with respect to the time reversal operation, channel of the singlet-triplet conversion. At the level of the diffusive equation, the existence of the spin-dependent Lorentz force translates to the dependence of the anisotropic part of the condensate function uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the magnetic field. So essentially, uh, the Uzadl equation looks like the divergence of the effective uh, condensate current, which is first proportional to the gradient of the condensate, that's a usual diffusion term, and in addition, there is a spin hole term. So those who know how the spin hole relation between the currents uh, look like, that's exactly the spin hole relation. So the uh, anisotropic part of the distribution function or the anisotropic part of the condensate is first proportional to the gradient, so it, uh, the motion is produced by non-uniformity, and second, the non-uniformity why the spin hole coupling produces the motion in the perpendicular direction. So what does the uh, SU2 Lorentz force? It produces the coupling between the gradient of, say, triplet condensate, it produces the motion of a singlet condensate. So all in all, we recover the anticipated structure of the uh, Uzadal equation out of this uh, <coughs> model which describes the spin-orbit coupling why the, the, the terms linear in momentum. So we have the covariant diffusion which contains the spin precession and the spin relaxation. The usual uh, penetration depth in the superconductor coupling between the Zeeman field, via Zeeman field between the singlet and triplet condensate and in addition the Lorentz force term which produces a gradient coupling between spin and charge degrees of freedom. If we look more closely on those equations, this is better structure by separating the singlet and triplet condensate. This is a usual part up to the presence here, the covariant Laplacian, which includes the spin rotation and the spin relaxation. We have two channels of the singlet-triplet conversion. Usual channel, why the Zeeman field, which carries the phase shift by pi half and the gradient coupling between the singlet and the triplet condensate, which doesn't have any phase shift. So we have two channels of converting the singlet into the triplet. First, why the exchange? And second, why the spin hole torque? If there is no one of those coupling, then we generate out of singlet triplet and then back singlet without any phase shift. But if both are present, then we can generate a triplet with a phase shift pi half. It will be an imaginary triplet and then generate again back singlet and then we rotate the phase so we produce a complex or imaginary part of a singlet. And this results in the anomalous current. 
So eventually, out of those, those equations, one can immediately get that if we will somehow produce a phase gradient of a singlet condensate, we will generate a spin. So anomalous spin out of uh, the spin generated by a supercurrent. Or other way around, if we simply have this, <coughs> this term, so the singlet triplet coupling via the uh, spin hole torque, and apply a Zeeman field, we will generate a current. So those equations in the bulk carry current, so they produce a current, anomalous current. And this is obtained right away out of those equations. This result is generically known, it was obtained by Edelstein via complicated solution of the, of the number equations, but essentially the physics is sitting in these two channels of the singlet triplet conversion. In the Josephson geometry, this, the existence of these two channels of the singular triplet conversion produces the anomalous phase. So the shift of the phase in the, Josephson, in, the, in the Josephson relation. In the absence of the phase difference between the two contacts, still there is an anomalous current. And this anomalous current is related to the generation of the complex uh, complex condensate out of the originally real condensate of a contact. Here I show the example uh, for the 2D bridge in between two bulk superconductors with the uh, Rajbo spin orbit coupling and the, in the presence of the Zeeman field. So probably it makes a sense to look, for example, on this figure. So we see here the dependence of the anomalous phase shift so the phi naught on the Zeeman field. If you wouldn't have uh, the spin orbit coupling, it will be <coughs> just in tr transition. So for, for, for larger age, we have a transition into the pi junction. Yeah, so here for small age, we don't have, so we, we would have just steps in here, which would be a transition in between the usual junction and pi junction. Spin orbit coupling introduces the possibility to have all phases intermediate between zero and pi. Of course, for small uh, spin orbit coupling, we have just the uh, smooth steps. So I about three still, minutes, huh? Yeah. You have about three minutes. Three minutes, okay, good. Okay, so then I, I, I may still talk a little bit about the extrinsic spin orbit coupling. Yeah, before, all discussion was about the spin orbit coupling coming from the band structure. But normally we have impurities and the scattering of impurities <coughs> also has a spin orbit part. And this spin orbit part in a normal spintronics, it produces in particular the spin hole effect. Yeah? Like in the, in the material which is cubic, which is inversion symmetric, like in platinum, uh, if there are impurities and the spin orbit coupling it impurities, uh, <coughs> it doesn't produce a, the, the spin galvanic effect, but there is a spin hole effect. So the extrinsic spin orbit coupling may produce a spin hole effect. And then what we will see in the superconductor if the spin orbit coupling is only at impurities. At the formal level, impurities are described by, by the uh, corresponding, co corresponding contribution to the self energies. So this V at the usual scalar potential, and this is the spin orbit, <coughs> spin orbit coupling at the potential. And at the uh, level of Born approximation, the scattering on the scalar impurities introduces the momentum relaxation time the double scattering at spin orbit potential introduces a spin relaxation, that's the so-called elliot yafet mechanism, and the cross uh, scattering, the scalar and sp spin dependent, uh, introduces the spin hole effect. This is in particular the so-called side jump mechanism of the, uh, <coughs> of the spin hole effect. The other mechanism are beyond the, uh, beyond the Born approximations. What is important is that in the superconductors, if we go through the mass in the superconductors, we will get the, all those terms which we had in a, in a classical spintronic. So in particular, the spin hole effect, the spin hole <laughs> coupling, that's a, again the anisotropic part of the, of the condensate function. It is coupled 
to the triplet, uh, to, to the non-uniformity non of, of, the, of the triplet condensate via the spin hole angle, and then there is an additional uh, so-called spin current swapping term, so which means that the uh, spin current is carrying spin in that direction and flow it in that direction, generates the spin current flow in that direction and with spin. So the, the space and time uh, indices of, of the spin current are swapped. Here, the same effect we are getting for the condensate. What is important is that in the, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the last slide, essentially. What is important that uh, this term and this term are purely transfers. So the divergence of this term in the bulk vanishes. In the bulk, we have nothing, but what <coughs> is important that the spin charge coupling is generated at the interface, at those places uh, where the, the spin hole angle has a discontinuity. In exactly the same way as we had in the, in the normal systems. If you go below, you see we have the same kind of what? spin hole voltage? We will not have a voltage. We will have, okay. We will not have a voltage. We will have a, uh, the current will generate a spin, uh, ge will generate super current, will generate a spin uh, uh, of opposite direction on the sides. Yeah. If we will produce a bulk spin, we will generate a current. Yeah. I may probably show you this, this last figure. Yeah. So that's what, what experimentally we, we may see. If we have a usual superconductor on top of a ferromagnet, yeah, just in, in, on equilibrium. So we put a ferromagnet on top of a superconductor, so which means that we polarize, uh, we, 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 we have a polarized condensate. This will produce an anomalous current flowing underneath of a superconductor. Of course, it should close somehow, and it will close inside the superconductor. Yeah, that's what we will expect for any superconductor on top of a ferromagnet, provided there is a spin hole angle in this material. This is hard to measure, yeah, how we can measure this, this current loop. But if there is a splitted uh, contact, then there will be current flowing from here to there. So essentially, we have a fine knot junction. So if we will close this by, by wire, then we will generate a current and in particular can measure flux. So this is the, by, by symmetry, this system in spite the bulk is inversion symmetric, it is not inversion symmetric uh, because of the structure. Yeah? So the surface breaks the inversion symmetry and essentially what generates a spin charge coupling and the anomalous current and the final junction is the presence of the surface. So the presence of the interface breaks the reflection symmetry with respect to the interface. And then by symmetry, the final junction is allowed and what is enough is to have just the spin orbit uh, scattering at impurities in the bulk, even if the bulk is isotropic or cubic. Essentially, the anomalous current is proportional to the spin hole uh, angle in the bulk times the spin splitting in the, in the material. And this is nothing at the, uh, at the anomalous hole conductivity. So in a sense, one may say, that we can expect the existence of, of a finite junction if you have a material, say ferromagnetic material, demonstrating a, a significant anomalous hole, anomalous hole effect. If you put superconductor on top of it, then it must be a finite junction. So that's it. That's, that's uh, my, my summary. I will leave it probably, but before I would like to thank my collaborators, so that the, most of this work was done in collaboration with, with uh, Sebastian Bergeret and partly with Francois, who is now moved from San Sebastian to France. Okay, that's the summary. So I showed that There is a very close connection between the effects known and studied very well studied in the last year in the classical spintronics and the uh, 
phenomena also studied, but from the different point of view in a superconductor. So there is a direct map between the generation of the spin helix or the persistent spin helix in normal systems and the long-range triplet condensate in SF uh, Josephson structures. There is a <coughs> direct analog of the spin hole effect and the Edelstein or, or the, uh, or the spin galvanic effect. These are the supercurrent induced spin or triplet accumulation at the surfaces or in the bulk of materials <coughs> and the Josephson final junction. These are the, the analogs of the uh, spin galvanic and spin hole effect in the normal system. The important outcome is that the coefficient entering the Uzadl equation, the tensors, the material tensors, which is a spin relaxation tensor, <laughs> the spin rotation tensor, and the spin charge coupling tensor in a superconducting states or with proximized superconductivity uh, are exactly the same as those governing the coupled spin charge diffusion. So if we somehow characterize our material, uh, platinum or any material, and we know those material parameters, and we may right away write down the Uzadl equation, and determine what happens if the superconductivity will be induced in that material. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>